the Lord has served them at table, and very likely before this interchange or this this poor portion of the of this of the Lucan discourse, as as I've heard it called, he's likely already served them by washing their feet. He has told them that one of them will betray him, and that and then they they argue about it, about which one it's going to be. And then it shifts, as often will happen, it shifts from who, who's going to do this betraying to who's going to be the greatest. And that's what happens here. Jesus has heard this before, and it shows that his disciples, and you can see this from Peter, Peter, Peter says that I am prepared to to go to prison, even to death. So to some extent, they recognize that Jesus is going to face a tremendous conflict here. Peter boasts that he's willing to go to it. So there is some awareness that, Christ, that this whole thing might not go as they, as they thought. In some ways, they have faith that it's all going to work out the way they think it's going to. People then, as now, get caught up in, in prestige, in authority, in power, wanting to be looked at, wanting to be important. Jesus' disciples were no different. Jesus has dealt with this before when the conflict was between Peter and James and John James and John get, they get mom involved and they plead and she pleads on their behalf and he tells them, you don't know what you're asking for. Are you, are you able to drink the cup that I, am, that I am going to drink? And he tells them they're going to. But to sit at his right and left, that is not for him to decide that that has already been set aside and by the choosing of God. And it won't be apostles who are at Jesus' right and left. It will be those who are accused of being robbers and found guilty of it. And they were. Jesus confronts this, but not in some kind of rebuke to them here. I think what Jesus is doing here is he's trying to, in some, in some ways, plead with them, with a comforting voice to them, to get them to follow his example. And he tells them about the kings of the Gentiles exercising lordship, and then those in authority are called benefactors. And so you're given lordship because you give, and, and you are given honor because you you give up great amounts of money. But that's not the way it's going to be with them. If they want to be great in the kingdom of God, they have to follow Jesus' example, and that is of service. And he says, rather the greatest among you become as the youngest. And I think that this is a reference to Peter and John the greatest needs to become like the youngest. In other words, Peter, you need to humble yourself, not to think of yourself so highly. You must all serve one another. But nonetheless, this discourse, it turns to Peter. Because contrary to what we think as Lutherans, often always saying, well, that Peter wasn't the, wasn't the number one guy. It was all of them. They were all equal. Well, no, they weren't. They weren't. Peter was number one. He was. Which is why the Roman Catholics are obsessed with him. We like Paul, I think, a little too much. 
overemphasize him over and against Jesus, often to the detriment of Peter. But Peter was the greatest. He was the spokesman. He was their leader. And he's the one who's called upon by Jesus to lead. And how is he going to lead them? By comforting them. By serving them. And then they likewise will serve the church. He commends all of them. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials. They're so concerned about their own greatness, and he commends them, I think. You are those who stayed with me in my trials, and I assigned to you as my Father assigned to me a kingdom. What were those trials? Jesus' ministry. His ministry was difficult. There were highs at the beginning, all of the healings, casting out of demons, and then Jesus reaches the pinnacle of his ministry in the feeding of the 5,000, and the very next day, he tells everyone that, in they, and that unless they eat his flesh and drink his blood, they have no part in the kingdom of God. Everyone leaves. All of them depart. The 12 remain. They stayed. To the point where Jesus would say to them, <laughs> are you guys going to leave too? And Peter responded, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've got nowhere else to go. <laughs> Don't know what you're talking about with this eating you. But we're not going anywhere. They were there when Jesus was constantly questioned. They were there when he was being rejected. They were there when he was being lied about. To them is, pro is the promise of glory. And they fight about being greatest. He tells them they must serve. He tells them that they will sit on thrones and judge the people of Israel, meaning the chosen of God. This is a reference to their apostolic ministry. After they've all abandoned him, after they've all scattered, after Judas' betrayal, after Peter's denial, 11 will return and be restored, and he will send them and upon them and their preaching of Jesus' word, the church will be built. The church is still governed, whether you realize it or not, by the preaching of the apostles. But the preaching of the apostles is the preaching of Jesus' gospel, Jesus' very word. And that is the foundation of everything that the church is to do that is the foundation of how we are to live. So yes, they were granted great authority. And through their word, yes, the people of God are judged. The word of God is proclaimed. People's consciences are stricken. And people's consciences are consoled. Church discipline is, is followed. And people are exhorted to do good works, to believe in Jesus, put all our hope in him, to love one another. Those that follow in their train, they exercise this ministry, this service, and they serve the people of God. Jesus turns to Peter, tells him that Satan desires, desires him so that he might sift him like wheat. These ones who have been so concerned about greatness, Peter included, 
Now Peter will be sifted like Job. He will fail. Even though he boasts, I'm willing to go to prison, I'm willing to die. He's zealous. The flesh is willing, but the spirit is weak. And he fails. Jesus tells him that the rooster will, it will crow. After Peter denies him three times. We struggle with power. We struggle with authority. We struggle with greatness. We struggle under the trials and tribulations of the church. We'd love to have a church that was comfortable like a living room. the pastor would say nice things and be a nice guy. Of course, he is, but sometimes his office doesn't allow him to let things go. The sifting of pastors happens. I've gone through it. The sifting of churches, it happens. And the members of those congregations as well. And many fail, like Peter. But not all return like Peter. It's not that they simply deny. They go so far as betrayal, like that of Judas. It's easier to come back from a denial. And Peter's denial is harsh. It's not that he denies that he believed in him. He denies that he even knew him. He forsakes Jesus. That's pretty bad. But not as bad as full-blown betrayal. Betrayal for that which the world offers. People want greatness. They want authority. They want power. And when they can't have it, they get angry. And they betray They forsake their friends, they forsake their Lord, they forsake their church. It's hard to bear the cross. It's hard to go through the trials of the church. But as our Lord says, no servant, no pupil, no student is above his master, is above his teacher. If they did this to Jesus... They will do this to you. Not just the pastor, to members of the church. It is easy to go down the easy road, but that is not the road of faith and faithfulness. That is not the road of discipleship. For to follow follow Christ is to bear a cross to pray that we not be led into temptation, to pray that God will lead us through it. And when we fail, as we will, we pray that God will bring us home and bring us back. He asks them about when he sent them out with nothing. Did they lack anything? And they said, nothing. God took care of them. He provided for them. He loved them. Jesus provided. He saw them through it. But Jesus is going to leave now, and everything is going to be different. The church will have to, at times, rely on the provision that God gives, the money sacks that will be provided. And even a knapsack, and maybe at times even a sword to defend ourselves. The sword that we are to defend ourselves with is not the force of arms, but with the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, to rely on Christ and His Word in faith, realizing that though they slay me, yet I will still love Him. 
This is what the church faces. There were 12 of them, now 11 because Judas departs, and only two swords. There's something else here. I think it's the money bag is a reference to Judas. He who has the money bag, go ahead and take it. And he did. But then he talks about the swords. And lo and behold, what did Jesus provide? They didn't have to sell their cloak and buy swords. For 11 men was provided two swords so that the story of Christ might be told even now. For Peter, who would be greatest, who would deny the Lord and run away, he himself would take one of those swords and cut off Malchus' ear. Jesus provided them with these swords for the sake of the story, for the sake of Malchus' faith. For it is believed that Malchus who lost his ear for just a few minutes, had his ear restored. It's believed that he became a believer in Christ. Without that sword in Peter's hand, Malchus may not have come to faith in Jesus, but he's mentioned by name, and that's a sign to us that he did come to faith. The very mentioning of him. So hopefully one day, in the resurrection, it is not just promised to the apostles, but the promise of glory is also for us. The promise of the resurrection is for us who believe, with whom Jesus is present. He's with us now. In the trials of the church, we see this in the book of Acts, when Saul was persecuting the church. And what did Jesus say to him on the Damascus road? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Christ knows our troubles. He knows our difficulties. And he says that everything that is said of him must be fulfilled. And when they mention these two swords, he says it is enough. And it was, and it is.